we talk an awful lot about change at the moment, and there's no doubt we're seeing a lot of change. But I think we should think that in many ways we're going back to the old days when change was normal. Of course, actually, we used to call it progress. We didn't call it change. Now we call it change. And we now think change is something to be worried about and to be resisted and to be cautious about. And we never thought that about progress. And in fact, my contention to you this evening really is that the last 70 years of incredible stability have been the oddity, not the current time is the oddity. And we've got used to the lifetime of everybody in, in this room and out there on the, on, on, on the internet, we've got used to the idea that things are pretty stable. We can predict the past, we can, sorry, we can predict the future from, from what's happened in the past. And we've got used to that idea and we've focused our businesses on getting ever more efficient, ever more focused, core competencies, doing this thing in a straight line. And is that really appropriate in a turbulent world? So change is, I think, what we should think of as the norm, not the exception. The Global Management Accounting Principles talks about management accounting as the communication of decision-relevant information to create and preserve value in organisations. So communication of decision-relevant information to create and preserve value in organisations. Not much about accounting there, interestingly, but there's a lot about decision-making. And decision-making is pretty important in this age that we're in, particularly in this information age. The strange thing is, we all expected the explosion of information to make decision-making much easier. In this age of uncertainty, in this age of rapid change, in this age of, let's say, going back to normal, where we can't rely on the world being the same tomorrow as it was yesterday, then we have to think about how we're going to impact upon decisions in the right way. And I think one of the other things we've got to think of in decision making is risk management. Risk management says you've got to think about what's going to happen and at least have some plans in place as to how that is, not merely doing what we've often done in risk management, which is waiting for something to happen and then react to it. I don't think that is fast enough. So management accounting for extraordinary times is the communication of decision relevant information to create and preserve value in organisations. Can you give us an example, this question says, of the kind of new skill sets that accountants in particular will have to develop to meet these challenges? Yeah, I think first of all there's a there's a set of intangibles that was talked about. It, you know, it's not the value in a company. I think whoever you remembered said 80% is now no longer in just the traditional hard assets. It's a think about reputation. How do you how do you measure that? And a, you can you can measure how how someone you know you can do surveys and so forth are there. But how do you actually really measure that? And culture is a really powerful. As Peter Drucker used to always say, right? culture eats strategy for breakfast every morning. That, but how, how do you measure that? And how do you compare it as an organization? That, that's a, a frontier, I think, where we need more from the chartered management accountants on how to do that, some standards, because that's a health measure. Uh, do you urge um, the people you talk to, the companies you, you advise and, and examine, do you urge them to embrace disruption? Completely. You, you ha I think you... If you don't, you are, you, there's a very good chance you will become irrelevant. And, you know, one story, and I, we don't talk about our clients, but it was, it was Mike Duke at Walmart. I remember in 2010 meeting him in Arkansas and Bentonville. And I said, what are the three things that you are most excited about or worried about? And he said, do you show Walmart? He said, you tell me your first three first. And I said, okay, technology, emerging markets. Um, and, I, and supply chains, those are, and he said, my one, two, three issues, technology. And this is, you know, 2010, Walmart is by far the most successful retailer on the planet. Scale, performance, um, just a powerhouse. And he, sat, he said, you know, my, what I'm focused on right now is we have to become a technology company because 5% of my products are being competed on in the internet. 40% of them, people look on the internet before they come into the store, but that's going to, I don't think we are seeing how fast that's going to move. So I've got to convince my, there's not an arrogant organization all, but a proud organization, we have to change. 
And he says that, you know, that people are saying, what's this guy gone? Just, did he go to Silicon Valley for a little trip and now he's all excited or what? And he said, I'm trying to push it and I'm not getting there. And he said, by the way, if you've ever tried to recruit a technology person to Bentonville, I'd like to meet him because it's not easy. There's not a lot of coders in, in Bentonville. So take that film forward to 2015. Doug McMillan's the CEO. I asked him the same of Walmart. He said, I said, what, what are the three things? He goes, I wish I'd listened more to Mike Duke in 2010. Because you see what Amazon is, yes. is doing, right? It's a, so the, to me, that's just one example. Why do you think um, forming the association with SEMA matters so much? Well, I think as we looked at it, and you know, we, SEMA and the AICPA came together to talk about the different trends and the different issues that are, that are facing the profession, we really do believe, we had a collective vision, that the profession itself is critically important in the evolution of business, the connection to society that Helena talks about, um, the creation of value. Uh, that, that the profession broadly defined, both from a, a CGMA or management accounting perspective and a public accounting perspective, is critical to sort of guiding business and society through that process. And at the same time, by creating a, a combination, we were creating a truly global footprint, uh, the largest body of professional accountants. And so we position ourselves and position the people we represent and the profession broadly uh, to be the most influential group in leading that change. I don't believe, and I don't think any of us who have been involved in this process, believe that you know, the status quo is at all sustainable in the, in the profession. Yet, Dominic used the word trust in, in his comments, the profession has this incredible value proposition that, that is centered around trust in a world that frankly not much or not many are trusted. Uh, you know, we can, we can think about institutions aren't trusted, political leaders aren't trusted, religious leaders aren't trusted, the internet's not trusted, and um, frankly, the media is not trusted. But the accounting profession is, the accounting profession has this sort of uh, golden opportunity to leverage that and help lead change. And the association gives us the opportunity to not only lead that and create value for the profession, but also for the business world and society at large. The status quo is not sustainable. Do you agree? Yeah, so I think, I mean, if we go back to the big events this year, I mean, the business consensus has been wrong on every issue. And clearly, I mean, we didn't learn anything. What, the last 24 hours has been a complete rerun of Brexit, obviously, in terms of the build-up even in markets the day before and the kind of complacency and the smiles and people getting it wrong, even the candidates getting it wrong in terms of who was on top. Um, and I think the misjudgment of uh, majority, it seems, of business leaders and also political leaders around the, the mood of the people makes it unsustainable. We're going to keep being, I mean, why should everybody keep being sort of shock and disappointment about things? Why can't we listen more and uh, try to develop a common language, um, try to develop the empathy um, and realize um, not just as a political angle, but from a, a business, from a commercial perspective, because I think you just get um, a counterproductive um, backlash against big business if, you, if we're not listening. And so I, don't, I just don't think it's a nice to have. I think it's just part of the, the change that we need to embrace uh, uh, within the business world. What is your assessment then of the global management accounting principles as a framework for future um, decision making? Because that, that again is a focus that you've been looking at. Well, I think it's got what it, it does have is that is all the different elements. I mean, I, I again I have my cheat sheet here is what I this little flywheel, which I think is a good uh, a good system to have. But it, it's got it, when you just it's got all the different elements that we've been talking about, right? Yeah. The very basics that one would assume you have in management information around on the on the balance sheet or where you know where the people are and so forth but it's a much broader set of uh, of topics that we're looking at too which get into the society you know like your water usage example even someone like coca-cola worries a lot about their you know it takes two liters of water to make a liter of coke right and so they it isn't about making more money, it's also having a license to operate in places where there's shortages of water to do it. And that's where 
you need a broader set of metrics than the traditional one. If you focused it on the metrics that we had in the, in, I'd say in the 1980s when we think about performance, I don't think you'd last very long as a business. You wouldn't have the license to operate. So maybe this wheel is probably going to get bigger and bigger uh, over time as we add more dimensions to it. But I, I, so I think it's, it's front and center to it. Moving forward, what do you think is the main concern? Because we've spoken a lot about volatility, we've spoken about short-termism, we've spoken about technology, we've spoken about disruptors and dominant views and that, but what is your challenge? I think it's, uh, it's back to some stuff I was saying earlier on. I think it's really about informed decision-making. Um, we are facing decisions on a much, much faster basis. It's, I, I talk about, I had the fun of driving along a German autobahn at 300 kilometres an hour. It's terrifying, five kilometres every minute. It's that, that's what life is like now. There's, there's things coming at you all the time and being part of making much, much more informed decisions rather than, frankly, kind of guessing. Talk to so many senior people in business at the moment and they're saying they don't have the information they need to make decisions. And so they're having to kind of go on gut feel. Well, gut feel's about thinking about what happened in the past, really. And as we're saying, the past is no predictor of the future, so we've got to, we've got to be part. And to me, that's the, the big challenge for us. Because I feel that we spend a lot of time, certainly in this country, talking about um, board diversity and lots of campaigns and projects, obviously some of which I've been involved in. But I do think one of the missing ingredients still is welcoming true diversity of thought. That actually, um, in fact, again, this review announcements this morning, uh, one of the chairman, uh, Charles Berry from Weir Group, was saying that actually he feels, on reflection, that he was shocked and surprised by what happened over Brexit, what happened over Trump, because he didn't have enough inputs, you know, echoing your point, Andrew, that actually he's listening to the same people. And I do worry, um, and it's not a criticism at all of the fine work and the management accounting principles and so forth, but we mustn't get into, again, another bubble of thinking because we've got fine words, fine principles, that we are connecting with those whose views we also need to take on board. I mean, I think one challenge is, um, obviously, ultimately, you want to move beyond identity, diversity. Um, you want it to be natural and you want more, we're talking about it vaguely, but diversity of thought. Um, and I'm wondering, I mean, I don't know that it'll work, but I think um, the Prime Minister's, uh, you know, quite sweeping request for uh, uh, capitalism that benefits many, not the few, and a big overhaul of, again, the corporate governance framework here, including possibility of workers on boards and bigger, more radical ideas, maybe uh, the, the thing that we need, because I suppose I, I am at this stage not cynical about progress on gender or even, you know, we've had a big report last week on ethnicity on boards here, but, but I suppose I just don't see yet the real desire for challenge to conventional thinking. And that, I think, is, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to welcome dissonant views. Um, and, and I'm not sure that you can have a campaign for that. You have to have a different sort of leadership that is saying, I don't have all the answers. I want to understand more. I will listen. I actually think the biggest difference right now between, if I could call it the, the Asian CEO or let's say the Asian investor versus the Anglo-Saxon corporate or investor is the time frame. That's the biggest uh, difference. So you see people thinking 30, 40, 50 years in terms of a time frame versus two, three years. And that's a huge competitive advantage because when you get volatility or changes, you can you can double down when other people are, are running. And that's the biggest shift I see. But, but I think it's the time frame. And that for the whole reason, in fact, I got interested in this long-term capitalism was when I moved from Shanghai to London. And I have this rule of seeing, I have to see two CEOs a day because I'm, I'm not a, allowed to do client work anymore. I'm not reliable enough. So it's my way of keeping connected. <laughs> but when I do, what, what shocked me was the time frame difference. You know, people, here worrying about the, the quarter or the one year, I'd say, why aren't you investing um, in Indonesia? Were you crazy? I mean, that's time, it, 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 that was the biggest gap. And so I think that that's a, a competitive advantage for them because of the time frame.
tying back into the, to the Asian question, there are examples in Asia where there is support to that notion that's being uh, articulated inside, particularly in China, it's being articulated uh, to the business leaders of China from the Ministry of Finance. That's at the beginning of that, but that certainly will have some ancillary effects in, in other parts of that region. Um, you know, clearly, uh, you know, the U.S. is the largest capital market, so there needs to be adoption and, and movement in the U.S. Um, there are an awful lot of regulatory and litigious uh, impediments that people think about when, when they think about these types of, of, of a report, at least the reporting part, um, dovetailing off of integrated thinking, uh, that are hard to overcome. Uh, I think the business community views integrated thinking, integrated reporting as something that should not be embedded in a regulatory process. It should be sort of in the free market system. I think we support that conceptually. Um, but clearly, progress in the emerging in in a, in a U.S. market, and then, in, for instance, in China and other places, will help set a tone from that standpoint. Again, I would say South Africa, the U.K., places in in uh, continental Europe, are doing a better job of moving that forward. Certainly, the FRC being a, a, not calling it exactly integrated reporting, but essentially uh, supporting that notion from the from its uh, sort of oversight roles that it has helps to make that progress, and we're seeing more of it here because of that. Some of it is going to happen anyway because the, the, you look at the millennial generation; they don't believe in um, secrecy and privacy in the way that we think about it. They they believe in openness and all the stuff that just puts out there on Facebook and, and the like that we, that we, our generation, my generation, thinks of as, as very worrying. So that they are not going to accept the sort of privacy secretism about organisations and, and integrated reporting is part of opening up, this is what we are doing and I think that's, it's going to come. 